Hi guys, Hengist here from Military Wargaming. Welcome back, uh, Beansters, and thanks for your continued support. Today, yes, it's French Somaliland 1940, episode four, and we're wargaming East Africa 1940 to 41. Here is the Cote Française de Somali, our overall operational map and its environs. And we're looking at uh, Operation Full Mean or Lightning Bolt, which is in effect. Here's the uh, theatre map. Uh, and we're going to look a little bit closer here. The red circle denotes the uh, main effort by the Italians. Galleon has fallen to Italian forces. The big red dot is the Badlands, where we've got sort of tribal rebellion and conflict taking place. And uh, in this episode, we're going to look first at Lone Survivor, uh, a small incident there, and then a main battle at the Black Gates. As you can see, the axis of attack is through Galleon, Al Sabat, Daspio, Ho Ho, and then up. Uh, to Djibouti, it appears, uh, Dick Hills to the west. A big thanks to Red Force, the Italian players, of course, uh, Blue Force, which are the French players, Green Force, who's asymmetric and political, and our infamous uh, props and special effects department. First, though, the Badlands. And we're going to have a quick look there. Here it is in context. It's on the border of Eritrea, Ethiopia. Uh, and it is a hostile, rough, uh, and very dangerous place. And it's a playpen, really, for us to explore a number of things, asymmetric warfare, uh, long-range reconnaissance, uh, and all other aspects that we want to sort of achieve off the main theater as well. Within it, a central piece is the uh, Mount Doom, as I've placed it, a large flat hilltop. Um, let's go to Dawn in the Badlands now, and let's have a quick look at what we're doing there uh, within the Lone Survivor uh, game. Well, this is the last known photograph of uh, elements of 22nd Logistics. And as dawn breaks, they are currently uh, resupplying a reconnaissance unit. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a lax of sort of security and they're unaware that they are surrounded by hostile natives, so to speak. Now, these are being led by Adal. And this is a big step for him to actually attack some of his former colonial masters. But he's got a good plan, he's split his forces, and he's effectively managed to creep up onto the enemy. That has no real sentries out, and they are about to be uh, rushed, as we can see here, uh, by these natives who come out of nowhere as dawn breaks with spears and bullets uh, flying. Uh, the Italians are caught red-footed, and um, the only one that seems to know anything that's going on is the acting sergeant, Bastico, uh, who manages to get out of his tent and start to try and do something. Uh, meanwhile, the natives are shooting and throwing those spears, as I've said, and they're in amongst the Italians as they're racing for rifles and webbing. Uh, they, they, immediately, the natives strike, uh, but firearms uh, from the Italians shoot a number down. Uh, they, they start looting any vehicle that they can get. They can't operate the vehicles, but they can loot them. Uh, and it's beginning to be a Custer's last stand in and around the vehicles um, when one of the, uh, the natives hurls a spear, which uh, goes straight through the commander and pins him to one of the vehicles. It's not a happy day for the Italians and the natives keep on going. Uh, in the meantime, we've got Sergeant Bastico running around with what's left of the, uh, the logistics element, uh, firing pistols and anything they've got to hand uh, and desperately trying to get into their vehicles to make a breakaway. But the natives are on them, cutting down the rest of the, uh, the uh, scout element. And uh, finally, Bastico jumps into his vehicle and drives off. He's got no real equipment and he's going through a hail of uh, spears and bullets and uh, warring natives. And the uh, transport vehicle tries to break through uh, as well. But unfortunately, that is a pin cushion with spears uh, and it, it catches fire. Uh, that results in Bastico being the only man to break out, hence the lone survivor. Uh, and the rest of the logistics team are infamously taken off into captivity, which doesn't look particularly good for them. However, uh, as they begin looting and finishing off what they're doing, and there's great whoops of delight and ululations, we have this journey by our lone survivor, who, who goes into the crags and effectively is wandering around. He's only got a limited amount of fuel. He, he rests under the vehicle at night, practically terrified, wakes to really inclement desert skies with sand, and uh, he finds himself somewhat trapped. He gets lost but finds water, thank God, 
and, and rests again at nightfall, where he's uh, he's awoken by um, something or someone, uh, or perhaps something rather sinister. But he does manage to ultimately uh, drop the vehicle uh, he, because he can't climb Mount Doom and goes round it and eventually breaks out onto open ground. Uh, he's exhausted, uh, he's run out of ammunition and water and manages to meet uh, outpost Tarufi where he is met by uh, a startled and somewhat terrified Italian small garrison that can't believe what they're hearing uh, from this uh, babbling sergeant, but they welcome him in. Meanwhile, uh, Odell's lair, who, who, if you remember from the last episode, he had been bold enough with his warriors uh, to attack a small village and uh, basically made many captives and kept his warriors very pleased. Uh, unfortunately, some of those captives were killed when they, they tried to break away. Um, and uh, at his base camp, he sees something in the distance, which is a downed aircraft flying uh, somewhere to the west, a smoke trail. Uh, that crashed aircraft could be quite interesting. Meanwhile, in Djibouti, we've got a float plane landing uh, in the harbour, which has uh, Texaco motor oil written all over it. G Le Gentle Home is on an inspection. Uh, Djibouti is very quiet, although a lot of troops present. Uh, the policing is going on. The hospital, uh, that's being examined. Uh, the market has gone back to business. Uh, the infamous Mermaid Bar and Grill continues. Uh, Tintin remains at the Cavalry Club, but at police headquarters, there is even more interrogation going on uh, with their suspects. In addition, we have to consider Ethiopia and the Lion of Judea, namely one Haley Selassie. Uh, obviously, he's fled the country and is in exile as we speak. Uh, however, uh, there are musings that he will be returning. Uh, Adwa has not been forgotten by the Italians or the Ethiopians. And the Razis or warlords are, are now beginning to become active. Uh, their warriors perhaps are becoming emboldened. Uh, and, and they are collecting their arms and all sorts of uh, weapons. Meanwhile, de Gaulle has also become aware of Djibouti and also Fleming is active in um, Aden. So let's now look also at Indiana Jones and his quest as well, which is sidelining. He seems to be after the Ark of the Covenant um, and let's uh, hope he is digging in the right place. Uh, Ethiopia and its Coptic kingdoms are rumoured to have been historically uh, the home of the Ark of the Covenant and we'll be looking at the lost temple of Syrinx. Meanwhile, we now return to the battle action on the main front line. Well, here's a close up of the map. This is between the Italians RS1 and B03 being the French. Uh, it's Ambocto Pass, which is just sort of uh, north of Alisabet. Uh, and there, there's a road going west to Dinkhill and then the other road leading to Djibouti. Now we're dealing with the Alpini today and they will be fighting uh, against a, a Senegalese detachment. It, here is the sort of battle map, as you can see that road leading to Dinkhill, which is uh, rough, uh, whilst the other road leading to Djibouti and Ali Sabet to the south is, is good. Now we're also going to encounter an ouvrage or fortification, uh, as you can see from these historical photographs. Um, this is what we encountered in research. And here is the Italian plan Operation Stop. Now it was geared to basically surround and trap a retreating uh, French unit. Uh, and um, it was designed effectively uh, to do that. But um, it had a lot of cover uh, for contingency. Well executed plan. The uh, French plan is also Red Pepper, which uh, was based on a defensive position, but they also occupied the hill to where the Italian entrance is going to be, uh, which is a, a, also a further surprise for the Italians. Now, as we can see from the table here, there's a lot of open ground. This is an ideal defensive position and a choke point. It controls uh, access to really those crossroads. And um, as you can see, bunkers in here, which are heavily camouflaged, are gonna be a problem. There's an observation post here as well. And this is the, uh, the high flat hilltop, which the French have occupied with two medium machine guns too. There's wire to the front of their ouvrage, and um, they have a very commanding position. Now, at Italian battalion headquarters, they try and contact the uh, tactical commander, but he is unavailable. 
And so they have to move with the plan that they've got coming out of that pass uh, from Ali Sabet. They start climbing the, uh, the slopes there with the Alpini, who are very maneuverable there, lots of rope, uh, and start to deploy. They're very clustered at that Ali Sabet entrance, but the, uh, the French are awaiting them uh, on that flat hilltop, and those are the only u units visible. So uh, it's going to be a, a challenging game and, it, and ultimately the Alpini do very well to get up the hill so quickly and disperse and follow their plan very well. The French sit and wait. Uh, their commander is following his orders. A heavy machine gun platoon moving to the left uh, along with an infantry platoon. Now uh, you can see the ropes there uh, effectively being used. This means they can expedite up that hill when mortar fire now ranges in on the only visible really uh, French and the Italians move forward and dispatch their sort of, uh, I suppose you could say, bearers when they come under a withering amount of fire. Now they take casualties and the bearers are there really carrying uh, Zariba. Now at the same point, the Italian scouts and their first sort of platoon get up onto that hill slope. They're well supported by those mortars. Uh, and, and actually are following the plan. But there's a hail of fire and they can't even identify where that fire is coming from. And it's the bearers taking a lot of casualties. Uh, the machine guns basically are intermittent as well, but when they fire are causing quite heavy casualties. Uh, even uh, cards being played to jam that, even though they can't see where the machine gun fire is coming from. The bearers ultimately are to eventually break. Um, but on the left flank, they are getting into position very well. Uh, unfortunately, again, the bunkers open fire, heavy rates of fire uh, and, and are shooting down quite a lot of Italian infantry. And then they go on to overwatch. Now, the Italians have decided to try and take the key position, heavily mortar the, the hill. Uh, they tried concealed fire, that was jokered um, uh, by the French as well. But, you know, ultimately it's, it's, it's going to be a very difficult ask with limited artillery and they push through the gully, even though they take uh, quite withering casualties, they play lucky bastard and have lost no men at this point in the jump off. The uh, heavy machine guns and the infantry to the front start to dig in, mortar fire ranges down on those scenic leaves, even the sniper has a shot but no effect and then they try and assault that position. Um, they go in heavily handed uh, but even though the uh, French are sort of pinned, they give really good defensive fire and drive those Alpini back down into that gully. The Zariba is now being built at full speed to block off that pass. Uh, meanwhile, they, the, the, the Italians themselves are sort of falling back off that hill uh, and they're, they're falling back away. But the scouts have got forward and basically identify where these camouflage positions are. They take fire as well. Uh, lose a, a few men, but uh, ultimately are to fall back. Then smoke is really well used to extract uh, the Italian infantry back down into that gully. Uh, they've got an understanding of what the position is. The Zariba fence is being well built, and ultimately they've reached really their mission goals, although they didn't encounter the flanking enemy. Uh, it, this was really well played by both players, and uh, although the casualties were fairly innocuous. Uh, the French don't seem to have taken any. Uh, the, ultimately, the, uh, the Italians lost about 32 killed and wounded, uh, a lot of them bearers. But nothing actually broke, so it's all fresh. You can see the movement arrows there. And, and, and I would say a, a, a good outcome, really, for the Italians. Um, and you can see the points that have been scored in that illustration. So ultimately, where are we in postscript then? Well, this battle may be rather crucial because it controls these crossroads, but we'll just have to wait and see. Meanwhile, red have scored 93 and blue 121. And as we move forward with our war game and the definition we're using here, it's all about player decision making. But we've also tried to make this at both the macro, the large battle campaign level, right down to the micro, the individual man. And um, in this micro to macro approach, I think we're doing quite well. We've got cloak and dagger and humid in all of those operations. And we're gonna be looking at deep reconnaissance and testing for like long range desert patrols and things like that. And of course, you've got De Canio who's gonna be making a uh, an appearance uh, with his motley crew. I'd like to just thank uh, some friends, Rock to Recovery, who really do change lives uh, and recommend you support them. And ultimately, always remember the fallen. So it's bye for now from me and my new dog, Buddy, and do stop by and subscribe.